Good morning, everyone, and welcome to DinoFest at Home. This is a week-long festival celebrating dinosaurs and their prehistoric past and the science that brings them back to life, brought to you by the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. This program is being streamed to the NHM YouTube channel and will be available for you to share and enjoy with others on the DinoFest at Home playlist, and we'll add a link to that in the chat. My name is Michelle Barboza. I am a professor of geology here in Southern California and the newest host of EONS, the PBS Paleontology web series. I will be your host this morning as we learn more about paleontology and the folks with a career in this field. I'd also like to learn a little bit more about you, our viewers. So tell us, who's watching with you? Let us know by taking our quick poll, which you will see if you are with us via Zoom. Now, remember, if you are a kid, go ahead and ask your adult or parent to help you out with taking this poll. I will wait just a second so everyone can read through the questions. It's just who's watching. Is it just you by yourself, other adult dino enthusiasts, other kid dino enthusiasts? a whole herd of adult and dino enthusiasts, or maybe just some dino loving students. Okay, so before we jump into our conversation, I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. Today's program is going to be interpreted in Spanish via Zoom. For those of you watching on YouTube, Spanish captions will be available for you as well. Go ahead and click the gear function in the video to see your availability. For guests that are registered in Zoom to enable the Spanish interpretation feature, you'll see a button for interpretation on the bottom right of the screen. So you can click that button and choose your language. If you prefer for the original audio to be muted, you can choose interpretation button and select mute audio. We'll also be adding instructions for this in the chat box. So you should see right now on your screen, a screenshot of exactly what that'll look like. On the bottom right of your screen, you'll see that interpretation button. Again, that is for people who are on Zoom. If you are watching via YouTube, you can click the little gear icon to add on Spanish captions. For those of you that are registered through Zoom, we also encourage you all to enter your questions into the chat box. If you're watching on YouTube and interested in this feature, you can register via Zoom um, via the DinoFest at Home website. Okay, now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speakers for this morning. First of all, we have Erika Durazo. She is the Senior Preparator for the Dinosaur Institute. As preparator, Ms. Durazo conserves Mesozoic fossils, those are fossils from dinosaur times, and participates in field work. That means she goes out and actually digs for those dinosaur fossils. She enjoys sharing her knowledge about paleontology with volunteers, students like you, and the public like you. And as one of the first students to participate in the NSF-funded internship called Proyecto Dinosarios, she also wants to share and help future students get into that program. Our other guest is Valeria Jaramillo. She is the graduate student at the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA. She joined NHMLA, our museum, in 2016 as a Proyecto Dinosaurios intern, and a year later she was hired as a fossil preparator with the Dinosaur Institute, which is also here at our museum. While working, she transferred to UC Santa Barbara, where she received her bachelor's degree in geology, and currently she's pursuing her PhD and loves to talk about rocks, dinosaurs, and field experiences. So let's go ahead and welcome our two amazing guests. Now, as you can see, we are all in different places, and I'd just like to mention that even though you can see the museum behind me, it's actually a virtual background. I am on the balcony of my own home, which is why I'm not wearing a mask, so I'm quarantined, as are our guests. However, even though we're working from home, we are still able to continue our really cool jobs working on paleontology. So why don't we get started by asking our guests, what does a typical day look like for them? Erika, would you mind beginning and telling us what does a senior preparator do? Well, normally when we're not in quarantine, um, a senior preparator does all sorts of things related to fossils. So my daily tasks are usually being in the lab and kind of removing more of that surrounding dirt from field specimens that we collect and continuing to uncover and 
uh, expose some of that detailed, um, uh, just detailed uh, features of the bones. But in the summer, unfortunately this summer we can't go out, but usually during this time of year, we're out in the field and we're excavating more fossils to bring back to the museum to then later on prepare and then hopefully mount or accession into our collection room. But cur currently, um, since I can't be at the museum, I've been working from home on smaller little specimens. So um, I've been still actively preparing and cleaning and um, yeah, making sure that we continue to uh, get all those fossils prepared for the public. Hey everyone. So when you say prepare, oh, oh sorry Valeria, okay. just one quick question for Erika. When you say preparing fossils, do you mean taking it from sort of a broken bone that you find in the ground and making it something that we might see on display at the museum? Yeah, it can be a uh, variable things. A lot of times because the fossils are so old, most of the time it is gluing them back together. Um, they do tend to come apart. And so a lot of it is like puzzle piecing. Um, so I do end up a lot of gluing a lot of elements together. And then hopefully if it is something significant, then we'll be able to keep it stable so that we can mount it. Awesome. And Valeria, I'm sorry, can you tell us a little bit about a typical day in your job? Yeah. Hi, everyone. So right now, um, I'm a grad student. But um, so all I really do right now is um, read a lot. I read a lot of papers. <laughs> I finally, now that quarantine is like lifting a little bit, I'm able to go into the um, campus and use the machine um, one person at a time. So I was trained on using this big microscope that we use and I'm able to look at my rocks and like the tiny little features that you see in the rocks. Um, but yeah, I've been staying at home mostly um, and just trying to work on proposals to get my research funded. So both of you guys mentioned being in the field right through your project Proyecto Dinosaurios. Can you tell us a little bit about what is it like to go and dig up dinosaurs? How do you know where to dig? And once you're there, what do you do? Erika, can you start us off? Sure. Um, well, the first thing we do is we kind of figure out what time frame we want to dig for. So um, in the case when I started um, Projected Dinosaurios, we were looking in the Morrison Formation. And um, we were looking specifically for Jurassic fossils. So in that particular locality in Utah, um, the fossils range from like 150 million years old. And so a lot of it we do is kind of hiking around or prospecting to see if we find any little fragments or kind of any little bits that seem like they're valuable and that they could continue and there would be more fossils to collect in that area. And once you do find something like that, um, a lot of the times it's, a, uh, it's quantity, you find a lot of little fragments of bone um, everywhere. So it becomes more about the quality of the actual fossil than the quantity, because you want to make sure if you're going to put in all that time work into it, that um, it's going to be something valuable, right, to put all the team and the effort and collecting. So once we do find something like that, um, then we kind of start the quarry, right? So we start digging up and seeing if there's um, potential pieces because many times you can uncover a little piece and then it kind of dies it's a dead end and then you have to keep going deeper or to a different location so that's kind of like the first um point i would say so when you're digging you don't find a beautiful t-rex just kind of laying down on the floor that you have to pull out i wish <laughs> unfortunately it's a lot more labor intensive um than that yeah it's a lot Man. of piecing elements together. Valeria, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in the field? Yeah. So like you said, I when I first went out to the field, I also thought it was going to be like Jurassic Park, where you know you go out into the field and you see a fully like articulated skeleton there and they're just using little brushes. But no, it's really hard labor. The rock is really, really hard, like concrete hard. Um, so we have to use really heavy machinery. Um, um, hammers, chisels, jackhammers. I don't know, like they use really 
big tools um, and we're out in the heat where it's like 100 degrees and for lunch like we'll go and like in the shade try to <laughs> cool down a little bit from working all day but I love it it's so much fun and we actually have some um, photos of what it looks like when you guys are out in the field. So you mentioned heavy machinery, but I know you guys even just use stuff like um, brooms and some chisels. And I've heard of even people using um, dental picks and screwdrivers. How do you go from using like such a big tool to a little tool like that? Sure. <laughs> go ahead, Erica. <laughs> well, it just depends on what phase you're in the process, right? So um, when we haven't really uncovered all of the fossil, we're using more of the heavy duty tools like the jackhammers or what you see here, the pneumatic gun, um, just to get to that layer. And then once we do expose any bone, then that's kind of when we start going to a smaller size tool. So usually maybe like a different type of size chisel, but still definitely a, a hammer because like Valeria said, it's like concrete. Um, and then from there, very rarely, in, at least in a lot of the dinosaur material, do we use dental picks. It's usually when something very fragile maybe has come apart and we're trying to piece it together. But a lot more of those dental picks are used uh, when we go back into the lab for sure. Cool. And I just wanted to share again, you guys shared these awesome photos with us. This is kind of what a bone would look like when you are out in the field. So we keep saying the word in the field and what that means for everyone to know is when we're out at whatever site we're digging. Um, so I can see here that the bone is that darker brown part. Is that correct? That's correct. And you can see that it, um, it stands out more because um, we've used an adhesive um, to kind of keep it intact. So that's what that sheen is. Otherwise it would very much look like the surrounding um, dirt. So you have to really train your eye to be able to tell the bone from the stone. Correct. Very, very cool. So let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen really quick. Okay, so I have a couple more questions for you before we switch over to our Q&A session. Um, I wanted to know, when did you guys first get interested in science or paleontology? Um, Erika, maybe you could start us off again. Well, honestly, um dinosaurs and paleontology was not at all in my mind until I was well into an adult. Um, as a kid, it was not something that I was exposed to. I didn't have toy dinosaurs. I didn't have any of that. Um, I did love nature. That was my biggest thing that I later on connected. Um, I love the outdoors. I love plants, playing with rocks, dirt, like all of that stuff. So now I could see why I really love going to the field because it's kind of, you get to do that as an adult. <laughs> Um, but it wasn't much later until I was in community college and I did like, um, um, an in the internship program. And then I, my first time going out into the field, I was like, wow, I love this. Um, it, it has everything that, you know, I didn't realize you could do into a career. So it kind of put all of those elements together into one, one space, I guess. And so, that's definitely when I was, I had like my aha moment and I'm like, ah, oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> I'm like, I love this. <laughs> um, so that it didn't come until way later. So how about you Val? <laughs> okay. Um, same actually. I, growing up, I, I was also not exposed. Like I remember like we would always go to the park with my parents and they always took us and we played soccer and I don't know, just growing up, I guess in the Latino community, I grew up thinking like, oh, I'm going to grow up and do business like be a secretary or do something in an office where I'm not going to get dirty and it'll be nice and everything's going to be fine but um yeah same thing with me as I was taking classes in community college I took a geology course it was like the history of national parks and so me knowing that I love nature I took this class and I was like wow I can study the parks that I go look at and the rocks and like the beautiful scenery and it was amazing that's also when it all clicked um, for me. Um, and so I, I originally took the geology class because I didn't want to take any of the hard math or science, like science classes. And so it's funny because it ended up making me switch. And so after I like figured out that I wanted to do geology was when I had to start taking all the hard physics and chemistry and math, which was so much harder than the classes I had taken before, but it's all worth it now. It's, I love it. 
Yeah, I've been there, but finding out you can get paid to dig up dinosaurs, that sounds pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So after you figured out that you like geology and you like science, did everything just kind of fall into place and right away you were able to get your job as a paleontologist and go out and dig up dinosaurs or how did you figure out what to do next? Honestly, that's when um, this program was a huge influence. Um, having Luis guidance and all the other people that worked at the museum was super important because even when I went off to college, um, I continued that relationship and communication and would come down and visit. And um, that that's kind of, that mentorship is really what helped me keep going through the different steps. And then originally I realized that like, the part that I really love about paleontology is definitely the hands-on part um, for me. So I, I love going out there. I love doing all the labor intensive work. I love being the first person to see these amazing fossils uncovered every single day. Um, that, that never gets old to me. I'm like the treasure hunter, right? So I get to see these like jewels every single day, little features I'm the first one to see. So that keeps it super exciting for me, super new, super fresh, um, and just kind of gives me that energy to keep going and doing it. So that is the aspect that I really love and I hope I continue to do, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and- uh, Valeria, how about you? Sure, for me, um, it, it was, um, I remember I was in college and I, was, I had taken the class and I really, I had never been to the Natural History Museum or the La Brea Tar Pits. So it was like this one summer when everything started like coming together and I was like already older. I was like, what's it called? Um, so I had never really gone out to places by myself. And this was like the summer when I was like, okay, I want to go to the museum. So I don't need like my, all my friends to come with me. And I was like, I'm just going to go and adventure out on my own. So I went to like the La Brea Tar Pits and the Natural History Museum. And after I went to the museum, I applied to become a volunteer. And unfortunately I didn't get it that year, but then the year after um, was when I heard about the internship Proyecto Dinosaurios. And so I applied and I got in along with um, five other students, all of from community colleges. Um, so that's what the program like focuses on, underrepresented students that haven't had the experience to be part of the museum and go out into the field. Um, so uh, after, doing the internship where they taught us all these things and took us out to dig up dinosaurs. I like loved it. And I kept continued volunteering with the Dinosaur Institute for like, a whole year after. And then the next year when I got to go out to the field again, then I was offered a, a preparator position. Um, so that, that's that been amazing. And it just, from one little point in time where I was like, I wanna do this, it just like all kind of came together and everything followed. But it was like, if you want to do something, you go out and do it for yourself. Like, just do it, try it. It's worth a shot. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to just mention, because I'm not sure if we did, that Proyecto Dinosaurio is based out of NHMLA. So Erika mentioned Luis Chiape. He is the VP of research at the museum. So he's the head um, here and you'll get to meet him actually our audience if you tune back into paleo chats on Thursday at 10 a.m. So there's programs here at the museum in LA, but it's not the only program of its type. There's programs all over the country. Um, so kind of based on that, how would you guys suggest to our viewers and our audience who here is already ahead of the curve, right? We didn't realize we like paleontology until we we're in college. These kids are already tuning in. How can we from home or as kids participate in science or paleontology? Should I go? <laughs> go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so definitely, obviously right now it's kind of hard because we can't go to the museum and talk to the preparators and like talk to the people that are there. Um, but online is how I started. So I looked up online how to volunteer if you wanna volunteer. And I'm not sure what the age requirements are, but that's something you can do. Like definitely look online. There are so many programs that you can even do at home with it. I think like citizen science or something. Um, I'm not really sure what it's called, um, but there are many, many programs and not just with the museum, but with like other um, organizations um, that you can be a scientist from home. What about you, Erica? 
I wouldn't even recommend because I get asked a lot um, for kids that are really young, you know, and um, they're already kind of really sure of what they want to do in their career path, which I, I'm kind of amazed by. Um, so, I mean, I'm a recent mother. So to me, I've been looking into a lot of resources and I find that kind of virtually uh, being parts of any like parent groups and asking those specific questions. Um, your child is interested in paleontology or outdoors. You can definitely get a group of people that share that same kind of passion as a parent and you wanna be there to kind of provide that influence or pathway for your child. And I feel like that would be a great place to kind of get a group together that then you can do outings or they might have resources for you. Um, definitely our museum is a resource. Uh, we have a lot of virtual stuff going on currently to try to accommodate everyone during this time. I also recommend the SoCal Paleo Society. Um, I'm not sure if they're doing virtual stuff right now, but I know that they like meet once a month and they have different outings. That's also a really good resource if you wanted to reach out to those individuals and like see what opportunities out, out there. But definitely um, just searching and kind of starting that conversation on any forum or any way online and kind of, I would say getting a group of individuals that share that same interest and then from there kind of branching off to see what's available. Yeah, be curious, ask questions. You're already a scientist if you're doing that. Well, speaking of questions, I think we'll go ahead and start pulling some of the questions that our audience has been asking in the chat. So let's start with someone here is asking, Kathleen is her name, and she wants to know, what is your favorite dinosaur? Erica, could you answer that one for us? So normally I don't have a favorite, but currently Diplodocus is my favorite. Um, and the reason for that is because I spent so many years working on um, many vertebra or backbones um, of a long neck dinosaur, Diplodocus, for so many years that I've grown so fond of it. And it's, uh, it's become a favorite. So that's definitely my favorite right now. <laughs> awesome. Valeria, Adriana is asking us, do you travel around the world to look for fossils? I have not. Um, I've only been here in the United States, so Utah, and then the fossils that I was working on was from Nevada. That was not a dinosaur, though. That was an ichthyosaur, which is a marine reptile that lived way before the dinosaurs. Um, but yeah, science and like my major has taken me to different parts of the world to like, not, not world, sorry, to the country to look at rocks and fossils. Yeah. Uh Continuing on those questions of the field, Erika, can you tell us, Tiffany wants to know, how do you know where to look when you're in the field? So um, we're looking at the rocks. So every rock has a, an age and depending on what we want to um, add in within our museum collection, um, we'll look within that rock formation and then um, definitely on foot, we're walking, we're hiking and keeping an eye for anything that looks different. And then from there, uh, we continue to see if we find any fossils in that area. Yeah, train your eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Debbie wants to know, can regular people who are not with the museum go places to look for fossils? So they mentioned the Morris information, for example. Can either of you speak to that? Can we just go and look for fossils? Well, it's really based on what land you're going on. So um, most of the land that the museum goes to or our team goes to is public land. So we need permits and permissions to even just walk and prospect around there before even beginning to dig in that area. Now, if you're on private land, it all depends on who the owner of that land is. And then that would be open up to discussion. I know there's several places like um, Shark Tooth Hill or certain in California where people are able to go and dig for um, much earlier stuff. So like shark teeth and all different kind of marine animals. Um, but it really depends on what land. So that's like the first question. And then from there, you can figure out if you are able to or not. Yeah, and you mentioned talking to the Paleo Society or other paleontology groups. They would be a great resource for finding where you can go dig for fossils or even joining maybe a professional fossil team. 
Cool. So Valeria, Gideon is asking, because we talked about articulated fossils, right? And so for people who don't know what articulated means, it means fossils that look right like a whole dinosaur. So Gideon wants to know, why don't the bones on the site come in the shape of a full dinosaur? That's a really good question. And so the fossilization process has to be very quick. Um, sometimes, especially in the Natalie Coria, which is where we dig up that Diplodocus, Diplodocus that Erica was talking about. Um, so if you picture, you know, you go back in time and you're picturing the dinosaurs and how they are portrayed in the movies, you're in this like wetland, there's like rivers flowing through. And so like, you can picture the dinosaurs are here like drinking water and maybe there's like a huge flood that like comes and carries the dinosaurs and brings them to this an area. Um, so the, the fossils are not going to be perfectly like preserved, right? If you think of a major flood, they're gonna be like moved around and like broken maybe. Um, and then they have to be covered up really quickly. Um, so that's why you usually don't find a fossil that's fully preserved and like complete, you know? And what you see from the in, in the museum, they usually take bones from different specimens that they were able to, piece, able to piece together. So that's a really good question. Yeah, and I mean, think about it. Our bodies are held together, not by our bones, but everything that's covering them. So when the dinosaurs die and there's nothing to hold them together anymore, those bones are just gonna fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, Erika, Ryan wants to know, on average, how long does it take to dig up a dinosaur? That's a great question. Um, I'm gonna use the example that Michelle has in her background. So. Thomas, Thomas the T-Rex right there. Um, overall, that that specific um, mount has, I wanna say like maybe 70 to 80% of that same individual. So all of that is Thomas. Um, it's not from another, uh, another T-Rex, but overall that collecting, preparing and mounting took around 10 years. So it's a long, long process. Um, Cause you got to think about every field season we go. So we have to take advantage of maybe like a month at a time during the summer to dig up as much as we can. So then, you know, year after year to collect as much as we can at one point, then bring it back, prepare it, clean it off, get funding to mount, right. And finding the appropriate space. Cause dinosaurs are so massive. Um, yeah, it's a long, long process. So like eight to 10 years, I'd say for that guy over there. Yeah. Wow. Um, Valeria, Brianna wants to know, do you remember what's the first fossil that you found? Hi, Brianna. Um, oh man, I do not remember. I am not very good with names of the bones. <laughs> if it's not a femur or one that we know, then I have a very hard time identifying it. But I do remember that, like Erica was saying, you have to train your eye. I was like in this little corner digging up what I thought was bone. So I'm like spending hours on this little piece that looked a little bit different than the surrounding rock. And it turned out that it was just like a piece of clay that was a different color. So I spent all this time trying to identify this bone, but it was not bone at all. So that also happens while we're out in the field. Awesome. So Cheryl wants to know, what does it take to become a paleontologist? And Mr. Forero is asking, what degrees do you need to become a paleontologist? And maybe each of you could answer because you might have a slightly different story. Erica, well, yeah, can you start us off? There's different ways. I mean, depending on what avenue you want to go to. I know um, on the PhD level, a lot of people want to, you know, they can have biology, geology, um, different backgrounds, and then you kind of the further up you go, you get right, way more specialized, right? So that can kind of go into that point. Um, as far for me as a preparator, um, a lot of preparators have different backgrounds, like in art. Um, I've found a lot, a lot of art backgrounds. Um, uh, my background is geology and also anthropology. So I've used those two aspects because I love bones. I love piecing things together and that kind of branched my way. But um, anything else to add, Val? No? Yeah, same for me. I only have a geology degree. Um, and with that, even before I got my degree, I was able to work on the museum. So it just depends like on your background and your interest. If you really, really want to go and prepare fossils, you can definitely volunteer at the Dinosaur Institute 
and not even have a degree. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, going back to a couple field questions, and I think this will be our last question since we are at 1030. I think it'll be a fun one to end on. What is the weirdest or the coolest thing that has happened during your excavating? So we had a couple different people ask variations of this, like the weirdest thing you found or the rarest thing you found. Um, Gabby specifically asked the weirdest thing, but go ahead and pick what speaks to you. Go ahead, Erica. <laughs> like the weirdest thing found. I don't think so much like as far as weird things of, you know, of your digging up so much as maybe like the, uh, the field season. Um, what comes to mind is the reason we nickname this particular quarry in Utah, Natalie with a G was the year that we um, found the quarry, we had no idea that it was gnat season in Utah. And um, we were we were bit up like crazy. Um, we, we really looked, uh, we really, <laughs> we really looked uh, pretty, pretty beat up. Um, we ended up using like silk scarves around our necks because any exposed skin was getting bit up, but that didn't stop us. We went through the whole field season. Um, we set up even box fans with our generator to kind of hopefully blow away the gnats from biting us. I mean, we were duct taping sleeves. Uh, it was a whole show, you know, we had all that, um, uh, the, the same medication you use for chicken pox all over our face to stop from itching. So I would say that was kind of the weirdest <laughs> season. Not so much with what we uncovered, but like the gnat exposure. Um, and from that we've learned, so we don't go during gnat season, but that nickname has stuck definitely for that particular locality that we go to. So that I would say that was the weirdest one. How about you, Val? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of thankful that I was not there for that season because I get the allergic reaction to mosquito bites. And you can see I have one here from going home <laughs> yesterday. Um, but um, for me, I think the craziest thing is just like the, at night. One, it's beautiful, like as it's uh, sun is setting, because we're camping on this plateau, you can see rain and like lightning storms from all around. But then it also at night when it's like alone and you're in your tent and there's like a lightning storm coming right at you, it's scary. It's really, really scary. So we usually have to like run back to the cars and just wait it out. <laughs> but that's the weirdest yeah as far as fossils I haven't found anything really weird and I, I think I noticed something someone in the chat put something if we found eggs um or like copper lights we have not found that there yet <laughs> and, sort of and for anyone that doesn't know a copper light is a fossil poop so yes there are scientists that study fossil poop <laughs> and on that note I would love to thank our speakers and you, the audience, for joining us this morning. There's more to come with our DinoFest at Home programming, so you can go onto the website and see all the other events that are happening. But if you enjoyed this paleo chat, you can join me again on Thursday at 10 with new guests. Um, and today, if you want to stay tuned, at 1130, we will have live animal programs presenting survivors of the dinosaur age, where you can meet a live invertebrate animal. That's an animal without a backbone. I'll be back, like I said, Thursday, September 24th. And my guests will be NHM paleontologist, Dr. Liz Chiape, who runs Proyecto Dinosarios, and Dr. Nathan Smith. Um, at 10 a.m. So again, for a full list of our virtual DinoFest programs and to register to join us on Zoom so you can be part of this Q&A, please visit nhm.org slash DinoFest. We'll also have all of these programs recorded and available for you to enjoy on our NHM YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.